boy, this your boy Lowe's up in the building trying to do good things for the women and children. That is my call sign. Uh, today is a very unique day today because we're going to be interviewing a wonderful and awesome author that I've been knowing for quite some time. I, I followed his journey, but I'm going to let him tell you a little more about himself. We're going to be interviewing Christopher Laird. Christopher, welcome. How are you? I'm doing good, brother. Thanks for having me on today. Oh, today, I, this is a good day. So we're doing, we're doing something pretty unique because this is more of a milestone for you, right? Um, we're going to be talking about your book, and the name of that book is Origin Four: The Rise oh. of My Kia. The Rise of My Kia. Origins yeah. Four: The Rise of My Kia. Now. I'm not going to tell people about what we've done in the past together because I know some things about, you know, uh, origins. And, you know, it's a sci-fi uh, book, but I want you to tell them in your words from start to finish. How? What was the inception to when it started? Where it all started? Well, I mean, this one was, uh, you know, just very fun for me. You know, the whole series is just, it's just fun. Like I love writing it. I love to continue the story and continue to write about these characters, man. Uh, they're just, the characters just fun to write about. Like I, you know, just sitting down and say, oh wow, now I'm gonna get into another adventure with Exana and the, the rest of the gang. Uh, it, it, it was a lot of fun, man. Origins 4, is uh i mean it is a beautiful fun book and like all of my books you know you don't have to be a, a strict sci-fi fan to you know read this i mean anybody can read this and kind of understand i think with some sci-fi novels it's very technical and it's very scientific and it's you know it can kind of just i don't say drag on but for it can be kind of boring for a lot of people who are not into science and stuff but you have this one where it kind of blends science fiction with kind of like ordinary problems that everybody's going through. So everybody can relate to, you know, this story. Okay. Um, how many books have you written? Uh, this is number five. So uh, this is Origins 4. So there's four books in the series. But I have one of unofficial book, which was uh, The True Meaning of Christmas from the perspective of an alien. Uh, what you did a stage play for, you know, last year. So that's kind of like the unofficial third book in the series, but you know, not really. But it's it's part of the series, though, in a way. So you 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 did a stage play for one of your books. Yes. Um. What was yep. the, what was the name of that play? Uh, the true meaning of a Christmas from the perspective of an alien. Oh. And, uh, okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How did that turn out? Uh, it turned out great, man. Uh, we had a, a huge turnout online uh, because of COVID. Uh, we didn't do a live stage play, uh, but we, you know, posted it online. Uh, a lot of people watched, actually from all over the world. So uh, we got some good responses from the UK, uh, Australia, England. Uh, so a lot of United Kingdom tuned in for the show too. So uh, it was, it, it was, it was a lot of fun. Origins is global. That means you as an author are global. And so with this, um, which one of your books was your favorite? Oh, man. Um, you know, I want to say part three, uh, Origins 3, the, the uh, children of my Kia was my favorite. Now, as far as all the stories go, I, of course, I love all my books and, you know, all the stories. But one thing I like about Origins 3, I think there was an evolution in my writing. So I think my writing has gotten a lot better. And I think that shows in my third book. So uh, I love for fans to buy my first book. You know, I'm very grateful for that. And then I say, oh, yeah, yeah you can buy it. But <laughs> but I think my writing has evolved in, you know, around part three. And it's my writing just improved greatly and it continues to improve throughout the series and as I write. So, um, so from a writing perspective, I'll say Origins 3. So would you say that your writing has been refined the more that you go or has, has its style, has the style of your writing has changed 
as you, you know, from when you started, can you notice a big difference in the way that you, you know, put the pages, put the pen to the pad? Yeah, I know it's a huge difference. And I actually, I like the word you use, refined. That's a better word. And my writing's a lot more refined now than it was like maybe five years ago. And I had to uh, credit my editors for that. My editors point out a lot of stuff, like constant things I continually do. Repetitive you know, motions, you know, the things that, is, is that some of the things that they pointed, pointed out? Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's continually mistakes and errors that I make, and they continually say, hey, you'll be better if you do it this way. Uh, you're right, be more clearer, you know, it's more clarity. Uh, so my editors, I had to really give, a, give it up to them for the improvement that I made. Yeah, I, I noticed, you know, some people like the authenticity of uh, authors, the way of I, authors dialogue, because the things that's coming out of your head is, is a true authentic portrait of uh, what you do as an author, um, has the fact that they change or modified your writing style or to get it to a refine, does that change the messaging? Um, it doesn't change the messaging. It actually makes it better and it makes it more clear for the reader. Okay. Um, Cause when they point stuff out to me and I look at it and I say, wow, that's a lot better way of presenting it. Or that's a lot better way of you know, showing it to the audience. So when they read it, they get a better, clear picture of, of what's going on. So it actually enhances the message, makes it a lot better. And uh, I wouldn't be able to do that without my editor. So they've been a really big help oh. to me. Is this just, is this your editors? Are they personal teams or are they, you know, uh, somebody that you found uh, online that, that that's kind of helped doing, kind of work for hire? Well, great thing about this, they're my personal team. So uh, I've been with them for a few years. So the great thing about them is they see my writing since the second book all the way to the fifth book. So they can kind of chronicle my writing style and uh, how I write. They know the story, they know the characters. So it's so much easier for them because they're familiar with my work and they know what I need to work on. So I think that's one of the big things that's really helped me out is them being familiar with my work and them being on my team for quite a quite a long time. So uh, the journey has been really great. They've been really, really helpful. Oh, that's that's awesome. Um, how many people you have on your team? Uh, I usually have three. So I have, you know, two editors that I work with regularly. And then we might have somebody else come in uh, like a freelancer to do the cover art and, you know, work on other stuff like that. So we have several people who work on the cover art. Uh, so those those change frequently, you know, from year to year. But I keep the same, you know, editors as far as copy editing, line editing, developmental editing. I kind of keep those same people on my team. Would you like to give them a shout out, at least to give them, you know, thanks for because it's a completed work right now, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, I want to give a big shout out to Cheyenne. Cheyenne is just awesome. She actually loves the books. <laughs> she loves them to death, and she loves the character Exana. But I think. Monty Hershoff has been her favorite character. She thinks Exana's too mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar with Monty. I did. I have seen the play. Oh my goodness, Exana! Yeah, she, 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 thinks awesome. Exana's, she thinks she's too mean. But Monty's been her favorite character for the fourth book. Uh, but Cheyenne has been incredible. Uh, and Carlos, I want to say her honesty is the best. You know, it's not just telling me things I want to hear. Oh, Chris, this is great. This is great. This is great. It's instead, you know, Chris, go. we should go more in this direction, this direction, this direction. So it's more constructive criticism uh, that's really helping me uh, advance. So criticism is good. I, I, I really need it so I know what I'm doing wrong so I can be better. So and she's really good at that. So Cheyenne has been uh, incredible. OK, that's that is uh, awesome. Um, so now we're here at Origins 4. Tell me something about the book. Oh, man, this is uh, this is a really exciting book, Carlo. So uh, basically, this takes this leaves off from Origins 3. So basically what happens in the story, uh, the U.S. government, they have a alien particle at Area 51. Oh, Area yeah. 51. <laughs> okay. yep. yep, they have an alien particle at Air, Area 51. And, you know, the 20th century is where the story first takes place at. 
So Exana, Michael Stratford, and his crew have to go back to 1953 to get this particle. And then they have to try to intercept an alien race that's trying to beat them to it. So you got an enemy alien race and you got Exana, it's Michael Stratford, and they meet up in 1953 and they're racing to, you know, get this particle uh, to try to save, to try to save their galaxy. And it's really interesting in this uh, story is Stratford and Exana, they end up in 1953, Louisiana, and they experience racism. Okay. So they, they experience racism. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, they experience the Jim Crow laws, and they're kind of confused, like, what is going on here? Why is everything segregated? And what, you know, what is this? So they're they're just really confused, and I'm not going to give it away. Right, 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 right. But, just, but there is a scene. This is one of my favorite scenes where uh, Stratford and Xana they have to use a phone. They don't know how to use a phone, and they're trying to figure. Oh, this thing needs quarters. They're trying to find quarters and all this stuff to <laughs> use the phone. So they see a, a whites only phone and a blacks only phone. So they go to the blacks only phone and it's it's not working. It's it's, okay. it's, not, it's not oh my working. god, the blackest only phone isn't working. Yeah. So it's so it, it's not working. So it's oh let's go to the this one over here where it's whites only. And before they get there, a small uh a black 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 boy goes to the phone and he wants to call his mother like he's lost and he can't find his mother but since the the black only's phone is broken he has to use the white only's phone so before he uses the phone he encounters the, a white gentleman who you know berates him and calls him all types of words and i don't want to give i don't want to give the scene away but uh something very pivotal happens at that moment uh, once the, the small kid meets meets the white gentleman who just berates him immediately saying, hey, this is the white's only phone. Use use that one. And the kid said, well, it's broken. So a uh, huge scene happens there. But this is throughout the story. And it goes from Louisiana and they go to Detroit and a lot of things happen in between. So uh, so it, it's a, it is a fun story, Carlos. And like I said, they're trying to find this particle. They're trying to get to Area 51, and there's so many obstacles to get to there. But um, but yeah, it, it's a really fun story. And I think you know, race is something, racism is something that we can all learn. Who people who are not don't know what the word means, or kind of it's kind of like you know what's you know what's the deal with it. So we, people can read about that too as well. What would you say is, is the hardest part of writing this book? Oh, uh, I would say maybe the most difficult part is, well, number one was my schedule. I think, you know, I've gotten a lot busier within the last year. So uh, with COVID and everything, you know, my life has changed like a hundred percent, you know, whatever. So just finding time to complete the book has been quite a task, uh, I would say. Um, and even though I, I really want to, you know, make a point on you know what racism really is and and how it affects the black community, um, some of the scenes were kind of I won't say difficult to write, but they were uh, maybe a little bit emotional, a little bit. Okay. Because you know, I, I tried to I try to be really honest on you know how you know blacks are treated and you know in society and even more so back then. This is 1953 Louisiana, so this oh is my goodness. <laughs> you know really this is really intense. But you know the you know the the aliens and the humans from the 28th century they're trying to understand you know why is this happening to black people like what you know what is going on this does not make sense so okay. um yeah so i mean that that's it was a little bit emotional a little bit for me but i really felt i had to get the point through to kind of you know make it happen so uh so those are probably the two hardest things i had to do did you find it difficult to um combine a futuristic concept of aliens with a time frame that was that predated 
you know, the, the alien generation, you know, because we're more receptive to, you know, maybe there's a life outside of, uh, in reality. The old South, and sorry, you say this about like with the Jim Crow's, the Jim Crow laws, the futuristic concepts of, of science fiction, was it difficult to fuse the two? Uh, you know what? It, it wasn't. You know, I, I think that I can make a pretty good story, you know, with the 20th century meeting, you know, the 1950s. And I think what makes it compelling and what makes it entertaining and even funny in some moments is a 28th century trying to get used to living because it's, it's, it's an archaic period. It's 800 years in the past. So, you know, they've never seen like cars before or, you know, use, like I said, trying to use the phone, the food, even the type of food, <laughs> transportation, the language, you know, so. I mean, it's probably more entertaining to see them struggle just to trying to do, you know, ordinary things that me and you can do very easily without thinking about. But for them to kind of get used to, you know, 800 year technology, uh, I mean, it's entertaining and it's funny. Right. right so right. I've seen them stumble around and trying to figure stuff out and, uh, you know, saying people, oh, they used to use paper money. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> Oh, quarters? These it's actually hard money? Like what is this? Oh, you know? So, you know, I think it's very entertaining to to see this journey that, that they're trying to go through and get things done. What would you say would be what's the funnest part of your book? Oh my goodness. Um you know, just just writing the book and and the characters because everybody's just so different from exana to stratford uh to lisa and uh just writing the characters and see them react to certain situations uh is fun to me and i think one main thing for me is that i know the characters really well this might sound weird but i feel like they're my children oh my you goodness know? yeah they, I, they you, you definitely birthed them <laughs> I, I feel like they're my children because I, I created them. I know how they are. I know how they, I know how they react to things. So when I write them, you know, in the story, you know, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I can do a lot of things with them because of their diverse personalities. So one person may not take the same thing as a, another person. And then you have these two personalities clash. And then you then this whole uh argument erupts and things go crazy so it's trying to get all these personalities together on one page and get them work as a cohesive unit and th that to me that's that, that's fun i followed your journey with um with the christmas play and one thing i noticed about your uh, writing style is is extremely entertaining i didn't think that i would even like sci-fi you know, because my girls, you know, my girls really into it. But then I, I noticed that when I was watching the play or watching the characters come together, because it grabbed me every scene. I think there was what five scenes. Yeah, yeah, five scenes. About five scenes, and and last and the last scene being the longest. The information, even though it was you know sci-fi. Sci it was very enlightening, but even more so than that, it was very entertaining. It grabbed me from the very beginning. Um, and how did you develop this writing style that, that would capture, you know, um, your audience from the very beginning? Is that something that, that was more refined because of this was in between origins three and four, right? Uh, yes. So, so the science, the um, the Christmas play was in between three and four. So now, where were you say you were at, and as far as your writing style, as far as it being refined? Because I was gripped. You know, I was. It was very entertaining to me. Where would you say that you were at that moment? Uh, you know, like I said, I think I was in a good place as far as my writing style. Um, but you know, one thing I always try to focus on is when I when I write a play or even a book, I want to keep people entertained. I, I don't want to bore people to death. <laughs> it's just 
because I kind of envision myself, okay, if I'm sitting down watching a movie or TV show, how would I react to what I'm watching? What do I want to see? Is that, that that's how I kind of view it. Uh, I want to be entertained. And, you know, if it gets boring for at least one or two minutes, I'm going to start to kind of fade away. Right, right, and right. The story's got to do something to get me back in. Right, so right. I really want to keep people engaged the whole moment from beginning to end. And we all see movies or read books where we're sitting down watching a movie and we're, we're looking at our watch and, okay, when is this? <laughs> I didn't get this. I did not. There are some movies where we're on the edge of our seat and we do not lose our eyes or our ears. We want to know what's going on every single second. And I think those movies are really special because there's an element in there that the director and the writer and even the actors have created where they can just grip the audience in there from beginning to end. And they're excited. They want to know what's going on. They're into the story. They're into the characters. They're into everybody. So my, my main thing is not to make it boring. And even if I had to put some historical stuff in there, I think that's fine. But, you know, I don't want to I don't want to write a story and start off with in 1492. No one wants to hear that. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I don't want to put people to sleep. So I think you can put an element of history in there just a little bit, but not too much where it just drags the whole thing down. So uh, my main thing is to keep people entertained and not you know, keep them gripped in where they're not so bored. They just drift off and forget what's happening. Is there a difference between writing a book and writing a play? Uh, there is. So the especially the format. So I had someone help me to write the play as far as the formatting is concerned, because that was something I wasn't familiar with. But, you know, the story I've already written. So uh, the true meaning of Christmas, it's you know, it was already an ebook, uh, you know, before the play. So I collaborated with the screenwriter to kind of put it in a format where it was, you know, fit for a stage play. So I think the only difference is was just the formatting uh, for me and kind of taking the actual story. The actual ebook story is only like 30 something pages, I think 40 pages. So it's a short story, actually. Okay. But, just condense, but just condensing it down into a uh, stage play uh, was something, you know, new for me so that was pretty cool oh but well, have you thought about doing making it an audiobook because i've noticed there's a rise in audiobook because people are so busy right a lot of people don't have the time to sit back and and read a lot unless you're an avid reader you know because me i'm more of a listener right and my girl is a reader she she reads i mean daily uh have you ever thought about making this an audiobook you know what I have? Uh, you know, I spoke to some fans and, you know, other people who want to buy my books. And some people say, do you have it in an audio book? And I said, no, I don't. So it's in every format except audio books. So uh, that's something I'm, I'm going to strongly consider because it seems like a, a lot of people, you know, do audio books. Uh, I even talked to a mailman, uh, you know, and on his route, he would just listen to books you know, on his route. So yeah, I, I love, I love, I, I love them, you know, and there's the audio books is that's, that's the way I absorb a lot of my, um, edutainment, you know, you know, uh, if you entertain and educate it all at the same time, you know, and audio book will probably be something that I think will be real good with this because during the play itself, it actually, I enjoyed watching the characters. By the way, where um where did you get some characters at anyway? Oh, I'm sorry. Where did you get those characters at that played in um because that's that's what I'm more familiar with, which is the Christmas play, which in turn makes me want to go back and research all of the rest of the books. But where did you get these guys? Oh boy. Um you know it was a variety of places, so uh, a lot of the performers I got from actually Craigslist, you know, Craigslist gave me a lot of good, uh, you know, actors, you know, for the play. 
And then I went to a, it's a website where actors go, uh, it's called Backstage. So I also went there and grabbed people. But uh, I'm telling you, uh, getting the cast was probably the most difficult thing I had to ever do. But at the same time, it was a lot of fun, though. Okay. Okay. So in Origins 4, um, which of the characters do you relate to and why? You know what? That's a great question. And I think in a way, I relate to all of them in a way. Uh, it's kind of weird. Like, I see myself in a lot of those characters. Um and so, you know, I, I think that that what makes it easier for me to write about them is, you know, that I'm kind of, I feel like I'm connected with them in a way. So like I said earlier, I feel like they're my children. So I, I really feel there's a, there's a piece of me in every single character. So I can't say Michael Stratford is just all me. I think there's a little bit of me in Stratford, a little bit of me in Exana. A little bit of me uh, with uh, Commander Derrett. Uh, so I think there's a, a blend of me in pretty much everybody in, in the story. Oh, wow. So the inspiration behind this particular novel, because like I said, you had one, two, three, a play, and then this. What inspired you to write this as opposed to just leaving it at three? Well, you know, it's just so much fun, you know? Uh, these characters, I feel like it's something like a, like an Indiana Jones or a Star Wars or a Harry Potter. Yeah. Like you can continue, you can make more sequels and more books. You can these are characters that you can carry on for multiple books and you know stories. So I think this is how the stories you know constructed that you it's it's not just a one and done book. Okay, we finished the mission. Now the world's safe forever. No, the world keeps getting in trouble. So they have to come out and keep saving it. And um, So, I mean, it, it's a lot of fun. And I really enjoy writing about these people. Uh, it is just, and people love it. Like, I have a fan base, a very small fan base, but I do have one. You do. So, I know you have one. You got, yeah. I know I can attest for one. <laughs> I'm not sure yeah. about everybody else, but I am. But, and you know what? Uh they they buy all my books every single time they're released um so i mean they're really excited about the series and a lot of people love exana they they really love her and she's uh, she's kind of like the driving force behind the, the whole series the, the the character i i saw um and who probably played her really really well in the in the play i don't know this is is that same energy is, will that be brought to this origins four uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. I, I even, even for the play, I don't want to say I watered down Exana, but uh, I didn't. You know, she couldn't curse and. Oh my goodness! Oh, yes, yeah, so I don't want. I didn't want her cursing on the stage because I want kids to watch it too. So, I tried to make Exana a little bit funny, but I mean, in the series, she's just foul mouth and just says anything she wants to and. Uh, you know, people around her like, why did you say that? You can't say that. And, you know, that's very rude. She's very rude. Like, she just doesn't have any regard for anybody's she's personal space. Or... Direct. She, <laughs> the, the character is definitely direct. It, 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 was any of that ad lib? Um, and, and you know what? I have an even better question. You did the book. You did the stage play. Is a movie in the future. Carlos, uh, it is. Uh, a movie is in the future. Uh, that is, that's something I'm really excited about. Uh, I mean, just going from the books, oh, then a stage play, now I see my characters actually on the stage play. Now to actually see them like in a theater, like in a movie, uh, would be a, a, a dream come true for me. So. Uh, so that is in the works, actually. Uh, I would say on a scale of the one to ten, with ten being it's going to be in the theater, we're like at we're probably at like two right now. So we're kind of at like level two, but we're we're actually trying to get there to ten. So uh, I want everybody to stay tuned for that. That's going to be an incredible. Oh man, that's going to be so. 
Carlos, I'll probably cry, man. If oh, I, <laughs> but I'll just... I'm so proud of you um, because I not only have, have I seen your rise um, from the uh, Origins 1, but but then I seen the stage play, which is another milestone. Many people never get to that point. Um, how does it feel to be completed with, you know, with a body of work such as yours? Oh, I'm really glad you asked that. You know, I never want to feel like I'm completed. Uh, I always want to feel like I have more to do. Um, feeling completed, it sounds so, it sounds finite to me, like, oh, that's it. But uh, I just want to just continually just to go on with this series. If fans just love it, they love the characters, they love the story, I want to continue on with it. And I think, I think from that point, it should spawn you know, more projects and more stories and more plays and movies. So, um, man, I'm telling you, it is it is just a blessing to be able to do this. And I'm glad I made the decision to write my books and do my play because uh, it, it, it's been a fantastic, uh, it's been a fantastic journey to do all this. Uh, did, did you learn anything while writing this book? Uh I did. Uh, for most of my books, I do a little bit of historical research. So uh, especially when they time travel, I want to make sure when they time travel to the, the 40s and 50s, it's, historic, it's historically accurate. Uh, the only thing, Carlos, that may not be accurate um, is Area 51. Um, I believe that it was not built until later on. Uh, but I have it set in. Confirmed that there is an area fifty one. <laughs> or is this just for the book? Yeah. Um. So some of the historical facts, you know, I want to make sure I, I kind of get right. Um. Uh, you know, when I'm writing the book, so when they time travel like this, oh, this is okay. Make sure that everything's you know right. Okay. So that we're actually, I was saying, not so much as the work itself is finished, but as much as it is, you've done more than most as an author, you know, because I've written some stuff. I've written some poems. I read, I wrote a short, uh, I, wrote, I wrote a short novel, you know, basically, you know, telling people stories of overcoming an adversity. And I know it's not easy and it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot, a lot of dedication to actually complete something. So up to this point, now what's going on in the future? Up to this point, what would you say? How do you feel to be have completed this much at this stage of your life? Uh, you know, it, it feels good, Carlos. It feels really good. And, you know, you, you really can't kind of, you know, feel that until you kind of just sit back for a while and then just look at everything like wow i actually did all this uh so i mean it's a it's a great feeling and um you know like you said i mean it can get difficult just finding the time to do it but it seems like my life changes from year to year as far as far as time and what i'm doing so the challenge is always there to kind of find the time to write but um you know i I kind of just make it work somehow. <laughs> so what do you do when things get difficult for you? Because I know, you know, everybody has a life. And, and, and when things get difficult for you to push yourself to finish or complete the work, because that's what it is. It has to be, you know, it's something that once you start it, you know, you feel you have a desire to complete it. But when things get difficult, what do you do to stay on focus? You know, Carlos, I think I have this, sometimes I have to take a step back and just kind of uh, look at everything at where it is and how I can improve uh, my current situation. So, I mean, even when I get writer's block, I try not to force myself to write. I just kind of just, like I said, take a step back and I kind of let the creativity come back to me. Like I could be eating a hamburger one day and I said, oh, that's what I needed. So then I get back to work. Right, right, right. Uh, but when I have other life difficulties, whether it's relationships, it could be job, it could be whatever it is, that can kind of take a toll on you too, because whatever the issue is, that can be time consuming. So those are things I have to consider when I'm writing, like my, my actual life kind of may get in the way. 
but uh, I had to try to stay focused and remember that, you know, I've started the story and I need to finish it. So uh, whatever I need to do to get it done, I need to get it done. So, um, so yeah, I just keep pushing forward. I know it sounds cliche, uh, but you just got to keep pushing forward, man. That's all I you, really that's all you that do. Because, you know, it, if something ain't completed work, it's almost seemed like it's moot if there's, if, you know, if it's, if it's not completed, you know, I said what it says, um, uh, ambition without action guarantees that nothing happens. If you're ambitious and have an idea, but if you don't take the action to complete the work, then nothing happens. And I, I, I do want something to happen. <laughs> How long have you been writing these books? Oh man. Uh, since I was 16. Um, uh, well, I go further. I go further than that, uh, man. Since I was seven, and mm, you know, I was, okay. yeah, I was, I was actually just drawing like movie scripts, you know, on the old the old school computer paper. Uh, I would draw, you know, my movie scenes, and they had word bubbles uh, above the characters, and I'll get the kids in the neighborhood to act out the scenes and you know do certain types of stuff, and then. As I got into the '90s, it kind of transitioned to like actually writing books. So, um, so I've been writing pretty much my whole life, from either even if I'm creating a, a movie or you know writing a book. Uh, I went, well since I was seven, I want to say, but if you want to say actually writing books, uh, probably when I was 16. 16. Wow, that's a it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of writing. <laughs> so. Yeah. What's next? What What do you have? Is there something that you plan on doing, or are you going to take a sabbatical? Uh, you know what? I'm going to keep going, Carlos. Uh, uh, currently, right now, I'm actually writing two books. So two I'm doing books at one yeah. time. Yeah, I'm going to try <laughs> to do this, man. Uh, <laughs> oh my god! And and uh, I I really do want to say. Uh, I am working on Origins 5. Mm. So we're working on Origins 5. And another book I'm working on, this is very special to me because this is a totally new book separate from the series. So this is just something else that I'm writing. And it's called The Journey of Tannis. Mm. And, okay. Yeah, yep. And I just I just finished chapter two today, uh, rough draft. So wow. Uh, this is going to be a totally different book, totally different vibe. Mm, so and, this is going to be sci-fi as well. Yes, this is going to be sci-fi. Okay. And and this is going to be a, a really interesting look into humans and how we live in the future. So um, I'm really excited about this because this is something totally different from what I've, I've been writing for the last five years. So this is. The name of this, the next one is going to be Origins 5. Yes. Are there going to be any of the characters that migrate from uh, the, the the first, the beginning series, or are you going to have, have a whole new cast? Or is it just the, the storyline will be different? Uh, well, in Origins 5, um, it's going to have the, the, the same cast, same characters. Uh, I might introduce a few new ones. But... This one really follows the journey of Ixana and and how she's come along for being a dictator to actually turn her life around and trying to be a good person, which is something she doesn't know how to do very well. But she's learning the hard way in a lot of in a lot of different in a lot of different ways. So uh, I want to continue writing the origin series as long as I can. You know, like I said, I want it to be like a Star Wars or Indiana Jones or Harry Potter. I want it to be something that's continual, that's perpetual, something that can go on uh, for a long time. Because I just love the characters so much. So, um, so yeah, it's it's like I can't let go of the series. Maybe that's a bad thing. I don't I, well, actually, I can see why, honestly, because you know what. Well, and the only thing I can say is, I learned a lot more during a play which had comedy in it, then I learned in real life about the origin of Christmas. I had no idea 
of all of the steps that you know what happened previously only thing i knew uh santa uh come down and bring us stuff uh, you know and and how the story of santa and it's just i want people to go see it can they see that uh can they see the play is there any place that you have it docked like on amazon or something to that effect uh well the play is going to air online december 3rd and uh, people can go to my website and aliencristmas.com and chrislair.net to to get all the information on when the, uh, where the play can be viewed at but it'll be december 3rd of, of this year when everybody can see it oh okay so it is going what you make it like a every year series kind of like a you know it's christmas charlie brown uh, <laughs> once a year <laughs> it, exactly i want to make it a, an annual thing i want to make it a, 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 a tradition uh, where people can watch it every year and uh just get new fans to come aboard and uh watch the play and i think in effect they want to read the book too because they want to learn more about these that's going to be the key but the one thing would make me wanted to read the book is when i saw you know the feeling that I get when I watch that, it made me gravitate. So this is something, and I would love to hear this in audio form. See, like when I'm going to and from, if that was even possible, I, I, I would I would encourage that. Um, where can they find, where can they purchase your book? Where can, where can it be found? Uh, Origins for the Rise of Mykia. It is on Amazon and paperback and Kindle. You can go to lulu.com. That's l u l u.com. You can also go to Barnes and Noble, uh, Books a Million, uh, to purchase the book as well. So uh, it's available in all those formats. Now I know you personally, but there's a lot of new potential fans that may need to know you and want to know you. How can they get to know you? Uh, fans can go to my website. That's uh, chrislaird.net. That's C H R I S L A I R D.net.